Thank you for joining UWI Press and our authors for Black History Month 2012 on our Facebook page at www.facebook.com slash UWI Press. You can get a free chapter from each of the four books being highlighted this afternoon on our website at www.uwipress.com. Also, the first three persons to write UWI Press on our Facebook wall before each presentation will win a copy of one of these books. Remember to press the like button if you enjoyed the presentation. This afternoon, our authors will speak to the question, how have the experiences of the enslaved and the effect of slavery in Jamaica been reflected in their book? Please join us in welcoming Professor Emerita Maureen Warner Lewis as she speaks to her book, Archibald Monteith, Igbo, Jamaican, Moravian. Welcome, Professor Warner Lewis. Thank you very much, Judy. Uh, I will begin by linking what I have to say to an earlier presentation this afternoon by Dr. Kathleen Monteith, in which uh, she referred to a chapter in her book, um, a chapter written by myself, Maureen Warner Lewis, called The Character of African Jamaican Culture. Uh, in that book, I, in that ch um, chapter, I highlighted the practices and beliefs in Jamaica that hark back to our African antecedents. Um, things like food, um, crops, like yam and okra, among others, um, food preparations, music, um, tying of head, head ties, and things like that, that still we still practice in Jamaica and in the Caribbean generally, I would say. Uh, that leads me into um, mentioning that my book called Central Africa in the Caribbean, Transcending Time, Transforming Cultures, um, also elaborates on that theme of the continuities between our lives, uh, how we live our lives now, and how the um, Africans who came lived their lives. Um, Africans came from Central Africa, West Central Africa, um, that is places like Gabon, the Congo, Congo Brazzaville, Congo Zaire, and Angola. For four to five centuries, from the 14th century, they came to the Caribbean. And this book on Central Africa in the Caribbean looks at um, the wider Caribbean, English-speaking, Spanish-speaking, French-speaking, Dutch-speaking Caribbean, and picks up on words and practices uh, that have remained in the Caribbean, called places like Colombia, Venezuela, um, Panama, and so on. The influence of that, those cultures from West Central Africa in the Caribbean. Uh, but it is in my book, Archibald Monteith, Igbo, Jamaican, Moravian, that I speak to the experiences of the enslaved and uh, about slavery in Jamaica. I want to begin this by saying that um, the life we know now in Jamaica and the Caribbean is very, very different from life as our ancestors lived um, in the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries. It is as different as chalk from cheese. And this has to do with the legal status of the enslaved. The enslaved had a very limited legal status. They could not give evidence in courts, um, they could be killed without um, any um, recompense, and uh, they did not. They were not perceived as citizens of 
the place. They were workers, laborers. Now I want to say that unlike what some of us may generally think, slaves were not bound in chains all day or, or not at all. If they misbehaved, then quoted in, in quotation marks, if they misbehaved, then they were punished and put in um, chains or in stocks. That's a wooden frame where they, they, they sat with their feet and hands in, in the wooden frame. Uh, but other than that, they, they lived their life just as we live our lives, with our hands and feet and, and bodies free from confinement. But the confinement was in their legal status. They could be bought and sold. They could be given as dowries. So when a, a white woman got married, her personal slaves were transferred to her husband's home um, as part of her dowry to the husband. So people were separated in that way. You could find yourself being moved from one plantation to the other. Um, the the um, you could also be um, manumitted. You could be you could be given as a gift to somebody, and you could be manumitted. That is freed if, for instance, you had behaved very well um, in in the sight of the of the of your owner. Um, if you had given news on some conspiracy or something like that, or if you were very emotionally attached to your owner, the owner could free you, and pro in some cases, free also your children. Um, but the, the main idea is that you were owned body and soul by some body but not soul, bodily you, your body was owned by someone else so there were two main castes in um in jamaica on and the slavery um and a caste is a condition into which you you are born or fall naturally in that society and you can't remove that caste very easily one was the caste of color, and the other was the caste of freedom. Um, once you were black, you were considered to be a Negro. That is, a Negro was equal to slave, so that you were not paid for labor. And you had to, and you have to understand that um, the economic ideology of the time did not allow for paid labor to black people. So um, this, this um, is the reason why, for instance, some blacks owned slaves themselves. Freed blacks could own a slave or slaves. Um, and ministers of religion also owned slaves because that was the economic system of the time. The other caste was the caste of freedom. You were, you were deemed to be uh, an enslaved or unfree person unless you could carry about with you some paper, a, a paper like how the South Africans were required to carry a pass until, uh, under the apartheid system. You had to carry your paper with you to say that your master had freed you. So that there were blacks in plantation society who were free, but they were always in danger of being, you know, their, their freedom was, could be doubted and they could be cast back into slavery. Now, the story of Archibald Monteith is the story of a young Igbo boy. He, um, the Igbos live in 
southeastern Nigeria nowadays. There was no Nigeria at the time when he came. He came to Jamaica maybe around 1802. And um, he was kidnapped from his home um, and brought to Jamaica where he acted as, uh, he was bought by a Scotsman. He acted as a companion, a playmate to the owner's children while he was still young. And then he would have graduated to doing things like hoeing and weeding and so on as a young teenager. And then he would have um, graduated to doing, taking care of animals because the estate on which he went was not a sugar plantation. It was a pen. Um, and that's why we have so many pens in Jamaica. Uh, these are places where horses, sheep, oxen were raised, mules were raised either for meat or as animals of labor to, to carry um, goods. Remember that you did not have motorized transport in those days. So that things either had to go on people's head or be carried in carts and so on. And it was the animals that dragged those carts. Um, he, so he worked on a pen. So he knew he would have known about raising horses, feeding them, um, you know, um, inspecting the, the, the estate fences to see that cattle from neighboring estates did not get in and things like that. And um, he, there was also coffee being grown on that plantation where he was. And that is in, in Westmoreland, St. Elizabeth border, the area that is now called New Market. That is where he, um, he worked. Uh, Slaves were also rented out by their owners. They were rented to other owners to do work like logging or things like that. Uh, coffee estate work was uh, milder than the sugar estate work because, you know, cutting sugar cane is a very difficult kind of work. Uh, coffee estates, there were usually smaller pools of slaves and therefore closer interac interaction between um, owners and, um, and their laborers. Uh, this young boy who came to Jamaica, who later took the name Archibald John Monteith, he, um, he grew up in an Igbo village where he knew that his mother's father was a very important man. And there was a certain kind of tattooing that he would have received on his face at a certain age, at, at, as he entered teenage. So he knew that that marked him off as somebody of high status. And what this story shows, th this slave narrative shows, is how someone who has, who has in their, who has been socialized to think of himself as important, even though he was captured as a, um, into slavery, brought on a boat, taken to Jamaica, and bought by a Scotsman, and had to work without pay, and so on. Even despite all of that, he still rose to leadership positions in the plantation system, because he became what is called a driver, that is something like an overseer or headman for the estates on which he worked. And he joined the Moravian church in his community and he became an elder in that um, church, what they called a helper. He became uh, important in that way because he witnessed a number of marriages. The, the evidence is in the archives, in Jamaica archives, the Moravian archives in the Jamaica archives in Spanish town. He witnessed a number of marriages. He, he was asked to be godfather for a number of children and so on. And he, had, he was very close to the missionaries in terms of 
advising them and going out with them to various estates to have to hold prayer meetings and things like that. Uh, so uh, the 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 book shows the normal everyday life of an enslaved person. He himself, in his slave narrative, does not speak very much about his work, but rather of his Christian belief. And um, as the title of the book says, he, he's, he, he knew himself to be an Igbo man from Africa. He knew his African name. He knew his father's name. He knew his mother's name. Uh, he could talk about the crops which his father grew and certain customs in their society. So he was proud of himself in that way. But he also became very Jamaicanized, living here under the plantation system from about the age of maybe about 9 or 10 until he died when he was about 64 years of age. And he was also a very dedicated Moravian. And it was the Moravian missionaries who took down his story and translated it into German and had it um, you know, sent, diffused it all over the world to their mission stations and so on. And th that story, what the book Archibald Monteith does, is to elaborate on the story which he gave of his life, the account he gave of his life, and um, contradict certain things that he says, support certain things that he says, based on my study of the archives um, archives in Jamaica, in Scotland, uh, and in the United States. Thank you for presenting today, Professor Warner Lewis, and we want to thank our viewers on Facebook for tuning in today. Please remember to press the like button if you enjoyed this presentation. Thank you.